Hello, hello, my space friends. How you doing today? Welcome to another episode of the Launch Sequence Podcast. It's actually episode 101. Weirdly enough, I'm filming it before episode 100 comes out. But we're not going to focus on that today. I've got here with me a veteran of the Star Citizen community, uh, ship guy, I like to call him, STL Youngblood. Thank you for joining me today, man. How are you doing? I'm doing good, man. How about yourself? Doing, doing good. Thanks. Yeah, it's... Uh, it's a Friday. I uh, we <laughs> we jumped in the room together, and I immediately was like, "How's your weekend going?" He had to remind me. It's not yet the weekend. I am. We're, we're getting there, though. Yeah, we're we're getting there. I'm almost there. It's uh, just a few more more few more hours. But uh, thank you for joining me today. I we're coming up on Invictus Week. We've had a hefty first quarter of the year. I would say, Star Citizen wise, um, even you yourself have, have taken a bit of a step back. But there's a lot of really fun stuff going on. There's a lot of stuff that's kind of in on the horizon. I know we always say that, but there are ships and things and, and cool things to talk about. And I wanted to just come in and have like a, a general fun episode. where We could just talk ships, kick back and have a feel good Star Citizen time because that's what they're good at. They're good at ships. So they are good at ships. Yeah. Uh, from a funding perspective, from a, a look and art perspective, from a a bunch of perspectives it works it works for them in a lot of ways definitely from the from the funding perspective too um so yeah thanks for joining me i stl youngblood was this is for everybody who's watching one of the first youtube channels i ever watched with star citizen so this is uh, an exciting conversation for me i love getting to talk to people who inspired me to get started on this myself and to be honest i don't know some things about the ships we've got listed for today and i bet you do so i'd like to hear a little bit more about them but i do love talking ships so I'm yeah ready. yeah but before we get started i want to know why you talk ships why you make content on youtube how you got into star citizen where what's your story yeah so um i think my channel technically started probably somewhere around 2011 somewhere around there i had recently uh, built a machine and started playing Battlefield with some friends. And uh, I think I ma started making videos to um, show them things that I was doing. And that eventually kind of turned into uh, almost like some tutorials that I was trying to put together and then montages and, you know, just kind of little stuff that had like, you know, five, six people watching randomly. Um, and then I had moved into Planet Side 2, which was a massive game, um, it, at least from a number of players' perspective. And it, um, there was an aspect of the game that was really about flight um, that always appealed to me. And it turned out I was a pretty good pilot. Uh, so I started trying to make videos for some friends to kind of teach them, like, here, here's how we could fly a little bit better. Here's some of the maneuvers. Here's the components of the game. Um, and those ended up getting pretty popular. Uh, and I think that's where I kind of started getting a little bit of my uh, YouTube chops there. Um, but in our organization, um, or I guess it was a clan back then, um, I started hearing people talk about Star Citizen. And that was probably 2012, 2013. And I kept hearing them talk and talk and talk. And I was like, you know, I might, I might dive in on this game a little bit. Um, and I did the same thing that probably everybody does when they're looking at making their first purchase is, what what ship do I want? You know, and I knew that I wanted that a uh, fighter of some sort because that's what I've always been drawn to is more the combat aspect of the game. And I spent so much time debating between a three twenty five and Avenger. Um, and I think in that time frame, you know, the ships were wildly different. There wasn't really a lot of information out there. Um, there were some forums on the website at the time where people would go back and forth. Yeah, uh, at, at that point, you couldn't even fly them, right? No, just, no, the hangar module wasn't even out. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but so that you're just hang comparing stat sheets, basically. <laughs> yeah, with a bunch of people that don't really know anything either. Um, so <laughs> we eventually got to the point to where um, we got the hangar module, and that was my first Star Citizen video. And I want to say that was probably, uh, this is going to sound terrible for the game, that was probably February of 2014. <laughs> As I looked out at my Windows clock Coming and see a 2023. 10 year, yeah. <laughs> 10 year anniversary, first purchase. 
Uh, anyway, so that was mostly a, like, you know, I, I had followers at that point and subscribers, and I was like, okay, so here's this new game I'm thinking about checking out. It's promising, it's cool, and blah, blah, blah. So so you didn't start with Star Citizen. You, you dragged those people with you into the it, yeah, crazy it, space game realm. It, it's it's a real challenge to try and get your community to kind of shift games. And eventually, like I was balancing the two for a long time. Um, and eventually some things happened in planet side where I kind of just became a little disenfranchised with it. And that was the point where I really kind of broke things off and said, OK, we're really going to shift things over to Star Citizen. Mm -hmm. um, but I had started growing a kind of a community base over there. Uh, really on the back of a single video that I made about the Gladius. Um, and that was the first Should You Buy video. Um, and I think that resonated with people and to your point, kind of becoming the ship guy. Uh, I think that video was the one that just made people kind of say like, oh, this topic is interesting. And I've asked this question of myself a lot, which I think is kind of um, probably what resonated and kind of had people buy in on the channel a little bit. Um, and that was 2015, maybe. Uh, and that was really kind of when the direction of the channel really started heading in a Star Citizen uh, direction. Yeah. When you were doing planet side stuff before you went over to Star Citizen, did you ever, I guess, end up in the same circle or, or uh, talk to morphologists at all? I know he used to cover the, that game back then as well. Was that... Did you ever talk to any of the content creators that were covering the game or get involved with them? Um, so I, w I was aware of Morph at that time, but we hadn't really like crossed paths. Um, I think the the ones that I typically saw a little bit more and had interactions with were like uh, Rel and Zoran the Bear and a few others that were kind of in that category. Okay. Um, and we actually had a pretty a pretty tight knit little group. Um, but no, it's surprising. You know, you start talking about Planet Side, and it's interesting to hear how many people came out, but. You know, you get on a server and there's 2,000 people on the server. Like a lot of times you're not even aware that, you know, you may have a big name sitting right next to you and all of a sudden you'll turn around and shoot somebody and you're like, oh, shit, I just shot somebody. <laughs> I know that name. Like, Yeah, that is that is pretty cool. And it's kind of, I guess, Star Citizen is at least aiming to be something like that. You just end up running into somebody that you happen to know from uh, some video or some Discord or, or Reddit or something. It's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah for sure. And it's going to, everybody's going to be so spread out too. It's going to be interesting when it happens. It's going to feel really organic, I think. Yeah. You know, because where things stand today, like there's not really a meaningful NPC presence, right? They just kind of pop into existence and then they disappear. Like you, you make if fun you of you it, at the stores yeah, and stuff. Yeah. Like, yeah. But you eventually see somebody and you're like, oh, like, oh, okay. Well, like I've seen this person. And I think the game's in a state too where you have a lot of repeat players that are on. So you have a familiarity with a lot of the people that you see oh, on yeah. servers. Um, it's it's not always like a lot of new names, especially if you start getting into like the combat circle or you start like doing missions with people, like the names become familiar. Um, yeah. Because we're creatures of habit. We tend to get on the same server type. We tend to get on at the same time. We tend to do the same types of activities. Um, so you kind of just get to know people. But when the game naturally evolves to a point to where there's not those servers, right? And you're spread across, I'm not going to say 100 star systems, even though they say it, right? But, you know, when you even even spread across when you have like Pyro, you know, with the size and scope there, um, it's going to feel a lot more, I think, organic when you run into somebody and the NPCs have such a heavier presence. It's going to be kind oh, of yeah. that, nice, that nice surprise and delight, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, right now it's it's weird to think that Stanton is a incredibly populated hyper dense system because you go like you said you could walk through the city and see two people and it's like yeah. this feels like i'm in a rural town you know when i'm in <laughs> a huge city like the freaking city covers the planet and <laughs> there's yeah. nobody in this back alley <laughs> like it just yeah it doesn't it doesn't make sense without the ai there and i think stanton even will feel just so much different when we start to see the npcs walking around like you said yeah, and I think just the natural interactions. Like you run into an NPC today, and I think, okay, most of the time that's going to be, unless it's a mission, right? You're going to see, uh, you know, somebody's trying to attack you or somebody's asking you for your help. Like, and if you think about life today, like that doesn't happen in the real world. How many people do you walk past where <laughs> yeah. nothing happens, right? Yeah. So I think those kind of natural, real life type of interactions, I think are going to be the ones like when you walk down, like a, you, you fly by and you just kind of flip your fingers, like you're driving a Jeep at somebody, right? <laughs> like 
like those NPCs are the ones that I think are actually going to have a pretty significant change on the game just because your your radar is not going to trigger like your the mental radar is not going to be firing off super hot when you see another ship because most interactions probably aren't going to be all that meaningful oh that would be nice oh my gosh i keep thinking about how it would be nice if like by default ship weapons were offline so that it would take some of that intensity from uh, like a just a general meeting nobody wants to just meet and yeah. always be on edge you know it, it'd yeah. be nice to know that the game is in a place where like you said the interactions are very like uh civil i guess yeah yeah and i think i think we'll see something come in that degree because i think you know we're, we're in that space where you're trying to figure out legality and you know um hostile intentions and those types of things and like at at some point, you're going to need to be able to defend yourself in a significant way without being like having to take damage first. Right. Yeah. And I think we've we've seen some of that, like the new radar lock feature to where you radar lock somebody and they go red and you can shoot them. And if things are working appropriately, you don't get a crime stat. Right. Yeah. Uh, but like things like that are going to be important for the game and maybe like weapons coming online from another ship is something that then means that you have an ability to fire first if you know the situation dictates it without there being punishment those types of things i think are going to be important we might see those at some point but it might also do exactly like you're saying encourage some of those more civil type interactions yeah yeah and they seem to be with like they're they're bringing up the idea of defending your ship from intruders now the missions feature teams working on that so they're like kind of starting to dip their toes into that which is nice um among other things that they've recently talked about i say let's jump into the into the goods for today uh we have seen the announcement for the hull c finally is planned to come into the game and it's not it's not planned like 2019 planned like they they <laughs> threw it up on the roadmap in four quarters it might be there everybody expects it to get delayed it's like if they say something's coming now there's a good chance it's coming so the halsey might be coming this year what in your mind does that mean for the game so the whole series in general i think is a really interesting one because it, it's an opportunity and a problem that they need to solve at the same time and it's the sheer amount of cargo that these ships can carry and even at the whole sea level where now all of a sudden you're talking about what's probably a fundamental shift in the way that we actually do commodity trading um and if that's even looking at it if you're saying that we're just talking commodities because in my mind and what i've been in encouraging and talking about and what I think I've started to see them talk about more. And I think the cargo stations are there because of this type of thing that I'm about to talk about is really cargo missions. Um, because we, we all know, like when cargo is good, everybody goes out and buys all the Laronite and uh, Astatine and whatever, right. They go back and they sell it and they're trying to make the massive profits. Um, and unless you've been burned a couple of times on a Larry Knight run and lost, you know, 1.7 mil more, a few times <laughs> to step back from it. But it's the, um, uh, that's that. Um, what is it? Ariel to Lorville route. That was a that's the one hot spot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyways, you know, we're, we're talking like, you know, if you're in a Caterpillar or if you're in a C2, I mean, you're talking five, six hundred, you know, SU. Well, now all of a sudden you start bringing in something like a whole C and now you're in the 4,000 range, you know, and then you potentially eventually get into the D where now all of a sudden you're up in like the, you know, like the 20 something thousand range and the E at like 96,000. Like it's like an exponential <laughs> growth thing yeah. that um, the game right now isn't really in a place to support. So you, you talk about being able to bring in a ship like the whole C and. Um, it's exciting. It's cool. I think when you start talking about multiple systems and an ability to take large numbers and potentially support org operations, because the cost of buying the goods to transport encourages you to have a lot of people helping you, because if something goes wrong, it goes very wrong at that scale. Um, but I think the single biggest thing is going to be how, how do we actually have the ability to load that ship up? And I think that's where cargo missions come into play. You know, you hit like an you hit a you know orbital station. You dock at the cargo station. You get filled up, um, and you're not having to buy the commodities like you would landing at a planet um, or even going to a space station. It's a take this from point A to point B. Really more of a delivery mission 
uh, and you're getting profit based on the task versus the gamble on buy and sell. Um, and I think that's probably what we'll see to kind of help support gameplay uh, would be my guess. But I think that's probably the single biggest thing that we need to really see the ship be meaningful in a, in a you know, in a, a real way. So do you, th when, when you say like a cargo mission, what would you imagine, how would you imagine that work? Like if, if a bounty mission tells you, hey, you've got a medium level threat in this asteroid belt, bring the ships that you think you need to blow that up. How would a, uh, a cargo mission work in the same kind of way? Yeah, I, I think it could potentially take on a couple different uh, factors. And it's probably a chain of events, if I had to guess, or, or if at least I was to design it. Um, and I think it's about what's happening in the economy and how things are distributed. So you could potentially say, in order to process astatine, a, a out or an out outpost uh, would need um, these types of chemicals, right? So now all of a sudden there's a demand at that outpost for those goods, um, and maybe two moons around one planet are actually doing that work, right? So instead of having a bunch of small ships deliver there directly, coming all the way from Pyro, for example maybe those chemicals are actually coming from pyro on like a whole sea to the orbital station and being dropped off at the cargo deck and then smaller ships are picking up missions from the cargo deck to take the goods down to the planet uh, you know so kind of shuttling things around um, i think that's probably more advanced than what we will see initially i think what will or you know like you can also look at dynamic events too right like xeno threat fires off and now all of a sudden there's a lot of injured people so maybe medical supplies at a high level tier yeah, are yeah. needed so you know, go pick up medical supplies from a station, take them to, you know, Jericho um, so you can support the operation. But it's like directing you to go from point A to point B, kind of like the delivery missions do today. Mm -hmm. um, but I think to your point about like severity, and I, I think especially like once like Pyro comes in or once whenever we get to Quanta and the, the heat maps that are supposed to kind of be able to trigger um, I think you start talking about risk assessment as well. And it may be like, this is a high risk cargo delivery. Start in Stanton, it's safe, you get the goods, you jump. Now all of a sudden you're in a high, you know, a high, uh, low sex space and there's high risk. Um, so you may need to figure out, I'm gonna gamble with no escorts. I need to hire three people. So now that's firing off combat or escort type missions. Um, but again, I think the single biggest thing is probably going to be the simplicity is going to be taking things from one point to another or maybe two, three places in a chain. Um, but I think there will be different like kind of idiosyncrasies between them that kind of make them a little bit unique. Um, and that may be story or requirements or difficulty and those sorts of things. Yeah, I, I, I latched onto that concept you had of a Hulsey possibly going to like a cargo station, like you said, um, or maybe like we could just say theoretically, if uh, Hull C is coming from Pyro, lands at Everest Harbor, that would be one cargo mission is what you're saying, right? Like that, that space yeah. station would have demanded a certain amount of materials to be delivered to that space station because it had demand from locations on the planet. So then it would yeah. kind of, it, it would kind of, the idea would be for the system to always roll that demand and, and communicate it to the next kind of node up the list so that eventually it gets to somebody who needs to make that delivery. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think that makes sense. And I think it kind of plays into what they're trying to do with kind of dynamic economy and events impacting things. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, who knows? I mean, there may be really simple things that I'm not thinking about or potentially more elegant things that play yeah, in the long, yeah, long term, but there's got to be, there's a, there's a bunch of different ways to do it. And I imagine whatever they do will be different from anything that we end up coming up with. But it is, it's interesting to think about, like, what's, are they going to, is this going to be a ship that gets dropped in? Giant, whole sea, game-changing cargo shipping ship, and it gets dropped in with no changes to, to cargo, to the way that cargo works, to the fact that, like, I mean, loading a whole sea I is going to take like 10 times as long as loading a, a, a I don't know, a, a freelancer or something, or something even well, bigger. Yeah. Well, I mean, it could go a couple different ways, right? I mean, it could come in and it could be beneficial, at least in the short term, because there's not really loading time right now. 
So, you know, if they don't change that aspect, it's just going to be really easy to make large profits if you've got the money to See, be able to support those type of operations. I think they will have loading timers by the time the whole C comes in. I think they probably need to, right? Yeah. The, it, it's almost like that exponential wealth thing where the rich are just going to get richer because they can afford to kind of buy all the goods. And if you're not kind of tampering that down a little bit um, by having like a timer or something that kind of limits the ability to use it, I think that's going to be something. Yeah. Um, and but to your to your original question, could they drop it in the game and not really change anything? Yeah, they could. I mean, we've had the reclaimer come in and there was not any gameplay for it when it came in. You know, we've had, um, I mean, the Terrapins come in and that hasn't really had any use case for the entirety of its oh, the life in the game. I know, right? <laughs> uh, you know, there's kind of even like the Hornet tracker i mean like it, it's almost like an on-field like cnc ship but it, it at least has the value of being able to do combat and dog fighting and stuff so i i think there's a lot of ships that they've just put into the game knowing that there will eventually be gameplay that's going to support it uh um, yeah so is it possible the whole sea gets dropped in without any changes absolutely we've seen it a bunch but i, I don't I, I don't think that's the case i hold them to a higher standard now because i think it was 2020 maybe something like that, when, when we got a statement, a very straightforward statement in Inside Star Citizen that they didn't want to put ships in without the gameplay anymore. And I think the one place they really dropped the ball with that was the 400i, um, just because like it's you can kind of be like, oh, it's an exploration ship. Technically, you can explore. You know, you're, you're pushing <laughs> it. But like, I feel like they have put themselves in a place where they should not be putting the hull C in unless they are adding in the gameplay for the hull C to be usable. And that means you got to change up the way that commodities work in the system. Because I think you, there's not even enough to fill up a hull C right now, is there? <laughs> I don't... No, I, probably not. I mean, with the ticker rated outposts of where you buy goods, like, unless you're going to go like fill up scrap on the planet and even then the, the, the ship can't land to do it so right you know i think it's there there will need to be there will need to be significant changes at least um mission wise cargo deck wise to commodities and pricing and you know i, yeah. I, I again i think they can put the they can get away with it a little bit on the ship because it's at the at its core it's a cargo ship and cargo sh is a gameplay that is in the game and works relatively well. Okay. So yeah, it's a it's a stretch, but again, I think it's anticipated and interesting. And I think it's one of those ships that people know a lot about. So if the gameplay isn't really changed in a way that's going to support it being what it's supposed to be. I, I hope they have the awareness that it's going to probably rub people the wrong way. Yeah. Well, as a game, it's a big deal. Uh, this is the industrial cargo haulers of of Star Citizen. This is like the real deal kind of industrial gameplay. Um, and this this is the backbone of the game. Economy is what's going to drive everything forward. Trade is what drives the economy. So I, I look forward yeah. to finally seeing them start to dive into that gameplay deeper than carry this box to this outpost. <laughs> <laughs> that got boring yeah. after a while. Uh, although funny enough, well, one of the things that I enjoy doing when I'm a little burnt out on the game or I've just been dogfighting for a long time is just going for a quick little delivery mission. Cause a lot of times it'll take me to places that I don't typically go to, but yeah, it's not, yeah. you know, it, if that's all you're doing in the game, it'll, it'll get a little boring. Yeah. It's a little, it's a little relaxation moment, which is nice. And maybe I'll do that in the whole C. Maybe I'll go <laughs> drop a couple, but maybe I'll do some bad. It's the most, uh, cargo capable, car cargo capable bounty hunting ship in the game, the whole C. <laughs> There you Try go. it out. <laughs> All right, let's 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 talk about another one that is very, very highly anticipated. A big favorite of a lot of people. Um, I know my, my man Drazen, who's been on this podcast a couple times, is head over heels for this ship, the Polaris. It's, um, I personally am not that excited about it, so I know I'm going to do people, I'm going to do it an injustice here, but what is your take on the Polaris? I'm going to also apologize, I got called call a prayer in the background, but... Go ahead. What do you think of the Polaris? Oh, all good. Uh, so the Polaris is one that I am I am very excited about, uh, mostly because it was probably the first big ship that I bought in the game. Um, and I think it it was also kind of the first capital or ship that was really, you know, within a reachable price range um, for folks. And you know, it's funny, the people that are uninitiated or the ones that haven't bought into the game at the tier that a lot of us have, 
um, you know, it's still a crazy expensive ship. But uh, it was also the first one that came with like naming privileges. It was the first one that was, you know, sub Idris sized. It, I guess it wasn't naming privileges. It was unique hole number. <laughs> That's what they did with it. I gotta, I gotta say the one thing about the announcement, the way that they announced the ship in my, I think it was during the citizen con. And if, if I'm right, and it is what I was thinking, it was terrible how they did it. I think it was just terrible timing. It was like the middle of a citizen con when everybody was expecting to see, like, I think squadron 42 news and, and stuff. And then they just dropped the ship ad for the Polaris. <laughs> it was like, uh, okay. Yeah. But, I think it, it, and it kind of came along with the interesting dynamic of it being like part of the, uh, what like the militia initiative right yeah like that was it yeah yeah where it's like okay like everybody can have you know a capital ship to defend and patrol and do all of this and uh i mean anyways i think the ship itself is um one that i am i'm interested in but i think what's what's been challenging for me a little bit with it is holding on to it while other ships of its class have started kind of showing up on the on the horizon you know it's like the the Polaris is there, and then the Hammerhead comes out. And the Hammerhead is, you know, the smaller ship. It doesn't have the torpedoes, but it outguns um, it outguns the Polaris. And then after that, you kind of had another scaling where the um, Perseus comes out. And now all of a sudden, you have a subcapital ship that has size seven guns on it. You're like, oh well, that's an interesting scaling decision. And then after that, you get the Nautilus that comes out, and it too, as a mine layer, subcapital mine laying ship, now has size seven guns on it and mines. And you kind of then start looking back at the Polaris and saying, is this hmm. thing a little bit outgunned now? Is it like a ship of its time? Like, what are we missing about this? Now, it is a bigger ship than those ones I just mentioned. It does have, I think, what, 24 size 10 torpedoes. Jeez. Size, um, yeah, it's it's got, if I remember right, five turrets on it with size fours. or may, They may have even been upscaled to size fives. Um, so I think it's, it's just a different animal, and it makes it hard to really kind of compare all of these. But I don't think it's necessarily going to be that ship that just flies around an escort, at least in its intention, um, like the uh, Hammerhead does, right? Like that's kind of area denial. Um, it's not meant to sit there and slug it out almost like a battleship, kind of like the uh, the Perseus is supposed to do. The way that it was really sold was that it's supposed to be fast because it's not heavily armored, but it has an extra shield on it. So it's still kind of tough. And I think they're setting it up to be almost that ship that's making torpedo runs. Um, but I think what it does say about it is, is that it does have enough turrets on it. It does have the hangar um, that, you know, if you were to use it in a situation where you're engaging fighters, um, it's it probably durable enough to kind of sit around and hang out and support an operation like that. Um, but the single biggest thing with it is kind of the capital ship argument that always comes up is, you know, when is it going to be practical to ever really use this ship? You know, how often are you going to have a need? Because you can argue that it, the single best thing to kill an Idris is going to be a Javelin. Well, how often is there an Idris around that really necessitates you pulling that out where that size 12 torpedo is going to get the job done right away? Uh, Polaris, I mean, you mean? Yeah, yeah, or, yeah. Yeah, that's what I meant. Sorry. Okay. Um, so... I, I think it's going to be the same thing that happens with all of these ga uh, ships when they come out. It's, is there gameplay to support it? Is it profitable? If it's not profitable, how do you make the decision that you're going to use it? Um, but from a design, I like it. I think it's a cool looking ship. Um, it's big and exciting. I like the idea of it having a hangar. Um, I'm just curious, you know, really how useful it'll be when we actually get our hands on it. Well, that's, that's an interesting point when it comes to these because people talk about this a lot. They're like, yeah, you guys want to have crews. You want to have, you know, 10 people on board your ship doing different things. But that's getting 10 people together all at the same time, getting them all into the same ship, telling them that they can all do different things, making sure all those different things are organized, and then doing that all on one general purpose. You're all going to some place or doing one mission. It's It's a ton of effort and it doesn't really sound very realistic for most people do you think that um 
that these ships are going to have that gameplay? I mean, you said that that's what's <laughs> going to determine the, the worth of a Polaris, but like realistically speaking, what do you think is going to end up happening? So do I think the gameplay will be there that will let people do that if they want to do it? Yes. Do I think it's realistic to get a crew of 10 people on a Polaris? Yeah. Because no, there's a difference between orgs going out on planned voyages like, oh, we know we have an org thing on Saturdays to do versus yeah. like, oh, I've got a group of friends. Hey, guys, let me call you up on Tuesday night. Why don't we all get together and go on my ship? Like, is it? Yeah. Uh, and even even in planned operations with an organization, I mean, anybody that's played with people in a group knows that it takes forever to get anything organized and done and i mean thankfully the game's more stable these days where you're not having as many crashes and people aren't having to meet back up but even then i mean the scale of the game makes the game challenging in different ways like you can have somebody that's at port alazar and you're trying to rally people at bajini point well i mean that alone is taking somebody probably 15 minutes to get to you by the time they pull a ship get out of alazar go through quantum travel request landing dock and then come to where you're at. Um, and that's one person. Um, and I think by that time is the mission that was relevant, that proved relevant to have that ship in the first place, even available. Like, you know, the, let's say you take a, you know, a extreme threat or, you know, the Idris mission from the Arlington gangs is available. Like, like, do you, do you have time to organize people in the way that makes those types of ships actually on demand? Or is it really just that tonight is going to be Polaris night and we're going to just load everybody up and see what we can do with it. And we just hope that there's something that really provides value to people. Um, and then I think with that too is, is the gameplay on the ships exciting? You know, being a turret gunner is exciting enough. The changes they brought in in 317, I think, um, were significant enough that made being a turret gunner fun uh, especially on ships like hurricane uh scorpius yeah. um but those are a little bit more nimble and dynamic but not everything you've got five turrets on a polaris like are all of like what about your seventh person what are they, are they sitting at a screen just waiting to shift power around you know, even, like I, even then those turret gunners aren't doing much when you're not in combat so yeah, yeah. There's a, these are the conversations that i think like we've always kind of had going forward with star citizen like yeah big combat ships it sounds like fun but at the same time it's it, we can't because we don't like the game is so far from that point we can't even discuss <laughs> whether uh, yeah. or not that that's working we're just now getting to the point where engineering is being considered once engineering yeah. is a thing then we can start to talk about how realistic it is on a capital ship but until then um it it sucks that this is all kind of a speculative conversation I mean, uh, to be fair, that's what we've been doing with Star Citizen for a while. We're <laughs> very good it would, at it. <laughs> <laughs> it. I mean, it would be nice to have clarity and understand what's going to happen. I mean, the closest thing I can say that we really know is at least what they've talked about. And if you hire NPCs, somebody can kind of do the Agent Smith thing and pop into that NPC for a while and then pop out. Um, but at the end of the day, like, you're not really upskilling yourself. You know, you can't really count on when people are going to be doing that. So... Um, we talk about N NPCs and civility and just normal interactions. I think NPCs as part of our crew is going to be something everybody probably should just get their minds around because I think unless something fundamentally shifts at a level that I don't know that I see happening, um, NPCs are probably going to be our crew on large ships. This is why I am a small ship person. This is why my, my ideal ship is like 50 to 60 meters long because I don't want to have to get NPC, you know, I maybe some ai blades yeah. but uh yeah no uh, I'm, a... uh, yeah i'm with you and i think i've also started getting to the uh point of like how often am i actually going to use this ship and when i get to like deciding if it's, it has a spot in my fleet mm -hmm. um and the polaris has come up multiple times in my mind about whether this is a ship that i actually see myself using and a at, at any frequency that justifies actually keeping it uh and i honestly don't know the answer on it I think it's, it, yeah, it's the smaller ships are easier, they're cheaper, they're faster, they're like, there's just a lot about the smaller to medium ships that I think just simplify your life a lot over the big ships. Yeah. Uh, then, yeah, that'll be interesting. Let's talk about something a little bit less combat related. The beloved and ever sought after Benu Merchantman. 
probably yeah, one were... of the most one of the most please give ships in star citizen history yeah i would say so uh and you know what's funny about this one is is you you kind of weren't really you know vibing on the polaris that way um I understand the hype on the Banyan Merchant Man, but it's not the one that I think really tickles my fancy. Um, and I think there's a lot about the ship, and I think it's cool. It's, I mean, frankly, it's big enough where it starts challenging the ability to do cargo in the game, kind of like the whole sea does, right? Yeah, so, you, you remember when they showed the cargo, uh, yeah, cargo bay of the ship last year? Holy crap. I've never right? seen a room that big in the game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks like one of the convention centers. Uh but yeah, it's um, it's it's big in scale. Um, it, but I think there's just so much about it that I just don't really know like how things are going to play out. Like it's it's an alien ship, so it's going to supposedly have rarity on its side. Does that complicate things like your time frame to recover it on an insurance claim, or is it more expensive to repair because those parts aren't made in human systems? Do you mm. need to go to a Banu dealership in Banu space to have, you know, work done on it? Like, um, I, so I think there's questions about general ownership with the ship that I'm interested to in seeing how they put in, and it always goes back to the same thing, which is how are they going to balance player experience from a gameplay? um what with like the investment and time in the real life like is is having one of these ships too much of a pain in the butt that i'm never really going to use it or see the value or is it just kind of some little idiosyncrasy that makes it feel like i own an alien ship um but yeah i i think it, there's a, there's a lot to like about the ship the design is sexy um yeah it carries a lot of cargo the the little uh bizarre that it's supposed to have is an interesting concept but i also don't really know what stops somebody from just loading up a bunch of crap in the back of a freelancer max and landing next to an outpost and saying like hey uh <laughs> just... young young blood's your breaker bar is open over here yeah Come see the corner like. shop you just get the fold out table and throw it on the <laughs> dust of daymar behind your freelancer yeah, yeah it's like a daymar bodega right like it's it so i don't know what will be done with the Banu Merchant Man that will really differentiate the ability to do any of that? Um, hangar, maybe dockings, maybe it's in space more than on planets. Like, I, I, I'm, yeah. Again, it'll it'll just be interesting. I mean, you could even argue that you could get somebody on board your caterpillar, and you've got catwalks above that would even let people look down and you know select things. So it's an interesting concept, um, but it's kind of like pointing to it and also saying like. Yeah, this thing's also going to be a blockade runner. It's like, okay, well, how? It's gigantic. Like, what is? And I also question how blockades even work in a six degree of motion type game. So, um, That's you know, Star I, Wars. I, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, so I don't know. I think it's a cool ship. It's got a great design. I'm probably not making any friends with not being overly hyped on it. But <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, let's talk about like the the central concept of it. Because, like you said, it could be used for cargo hauling. It's got a massive cargo hold. You could use it for just trading. Um, but at its core, it is the place for trading, right? This is a ship where you're supposed to be able to just be out in space, put out, you know, as far as we know, hypothetically speaking, put out a beacon to say, hey, I've got this, 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 and this. People will see what you have, uh, decide to fly over to your ship, and then, I don't know, dock, EVA over, whatever it might be, get on your ship and actually shop on board like it's a mall. As yeah. as a concept for a multiplayer game, I think it sounds pretty cool. It just sounds difficult to do. I think it's difficult if it's implemented in a way where you are setting prices for items that people can then purchase, like you are a store at like a station or something right like you you may not want to have to be the store merchant every single time like you may not want to have somebody dock with you and you have to walk around with them and be like hey you're not stealing anything okay this is how much this costs oh now we're going to negotiate and haggle now you're going to buy it here's the price now i yeah. facilitate the money transaction like if you've got three or four people on your ship at one point that may be complicated uh, or is it just a yeah, I, I don't know. I, th I think it's going to be interesting to see how it ends up being managed. Um, I also question, is there anything unique other than s size of the BMM that says that this is the only ship that can really be this flying market? You know, because... Uh, well, there's the Kraken Privateer. Yeah, that, that's fair. But, you know, like the... 
like I used a freelancer max before, like, can I use the same type of beacon in a freelancer max? It says, Hey, I got goods back here. Come take a look. Right. And it obviously isn't going to be the same experience. So maybe if I'm trying to become kind of that star citizen reseller and people are hopping on my janky max instead of the luxurious merchant man, my reputation may be a little bit lower. Um, but yeah, I mean, how it's implemented is definitely a big TBD. Yeah. Um, but I, at the same time, I would I would rather buy items from another player just because, again, we don't run into them all that often in the future. And no, it's cool. I, yeah, I mean, if I can, you know, kind of like, oh, hey, like you've. It, I tell you what makes this interesting, and I don't know why this popped into my mind, but is with uh, loot. Um, there's a lot of things out there that you can't really buy, but you find. Um, and loot might be one of those things that really starts bringing rarity. Um, and rarity might drive value in shopping from a player doing mid space resale, right? Because yeah. if, if I can't find the stuff that I want uh, because it's not available for sale unless you find it, that's something different. And I think that's where it could be pretty cool. And we're we're starting that now with they're taking components out of shops. They've already taken weapons out of shops. We see them designing things like relics and little artifacts that you could find at ruins and and trade. So the 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 crumbs are there for the beginning. And I think I kind of got what you meant by the whole, like, do you start with a freelancer max? You almost look at the Banu Merchant Man and the idea of being like a, a shop owner as a profession in the game. Can you maybe own a shop at an outpost and maybe that's a smaller deal than a merchant man or you're sh- selling stuff out of your nomad or freelancer, like you said, and that's kind of, you're working your way up to a Kraken or something like that. So that, yeah. that could be cool. Yeah, I mean... It's interesting because it, all of a sudden it almost becomes another gameplay loop, right? Is, right. You know, sec- secondhand goods reseller. <laughs> yeah. And you could be like paying explorers to go out and get you stuff. You pay them, they make the money, and then you sell it. You make the money. And like that, mm-hmm. that's, an, that's an economy. Yay. <laughs> like, yeah. Hopefully it works well, like that. I, I, I mean, no, I actually love that idea because I think for me, everything is I want all the professions to tie together in some degree. Absolutely. Like, like, I, I always envision this and I get really excited because I think we're really close, but it's like a large like mining operation within an organization. You know, you got people that are scouting and finding good deposits. Then you have the prospectors and the bulls that are actually coming and breaking. And then you're taking the bags and throwing them on a cargo ship. Uh, meanwhile, some of your escorts that are protecting you are flying back. People are selling, you're sharing profits. Like those types of things, I think for me, get re- me really excited about the game. Um, so when that starts to apply to other loops, like I'm going to pay for information, which is going to get me a good, or maybe like you say, I'm looking for these types of items, which is then going to trigger like scouts to try and go find it on their own. Or maybe they're buying for information on where to find it and they're bringing it back to you. And then there's a money exchange there. Like those things that have kind of that waterfall effect, um, I think are really exciting for the potential of the game. Yeah. That's, I think, what we are all excited for. It's like, it, it's why it's nice to see them focusing more on industry now than combat as as the sole form of gameplay they're developing. As you see, like, salvage and mining working together with cargo on the horizon, now refining is a possibility. All these things can work together so much more than a bunch of pew-pews, you know? Yeah, no doubt. All right, next ship for us today is the Galaxy. The uh, RSI Galaxy, I guess, technically younger brother to the polaris and one that made a few polaris owners a little a little stinky um what did you think of the introduction of the galaxy and the ship as a whole so the galaxy is an interesting ship and an interesting combat um i think it kind of uh shows to some degree the lack of certainty on direction on how they want to manage ships (laughs) because i think after they did the uh uh the vanguards with the battlefield upgrade kits. They were like, we're done with this whole variant thing and the modules. This was hard to manage. And then, you know, after that, we saw the retaliator come out with the modules associated with that. And now all of a sudden we're kind of at this part where we're at a large scale, kind of doing the same thing. So um, I personally have no issue with that direction. I think for me, one of the value cells that I always talk about in videos is versatility. And would you start talking about a ship that can do refining, medical, cargo, and that all kind of can support exploration as well. Um, and then they always give their little disclaimer when it comes to modules, you know, and more later, potentially. Um, 
<laughs> it's uh it, it's it's interesting and it's intriguing. Um, frankly, I love the design of the ship. Uh, it's very Star Destroyer esque to me. Um, it's a, a really nice design. I think it looks like it's got a lot of capability. Um, but again, kind of like we talked about with the Polaris, the are things going to be relevant by the time that I get my crew? That versatility when it comes to your galaxy is also going to be. How long does it take to make a shift between those? How significant of a change is that? And are you able to jump into the gameplay you want when you want to change it? Is it like a drop of the hat or is this a claim? Now all of a sudden you're dealing with a timer so you can then get the right parts on there. Um, I think a lot of the the proof is going to be in the pudding. Um, But I also think the other thing with the ship is that I don't think it's going to be the master of any of these traits. Um, And I think that's a general rule that we see when it comes to multi-purpose ships. Um, even those that are modular and versatile, uh, versus like a ship that can just do a little bit of everything like the constellation, the ones that can cross a lot of lines on gameplay loops are the ones that are proficient at all of those, but never the best at any of those. So, you know, I think you're going to see medical ships like the Apollo probably being better. You're probably going to see refining ships like the Expanse being better. You're probably going to see cargo ships like the BMM and the whole C being better. Like, But none of those ships can do what the other two do. So the value there is in the ability to you sacrifice a little bit of capability and the ability to do more. Which is why this wouldn't be the ship to get if you were only trying to do one thing, yeah. which is where the value of selling all the modules comes into play. But yeah, that's... And that's, I think that's where they can get people with the look. Cause it's like, you might not care to have, you know, a module or ship, but dang, the ship looks good. And you're yeah. willing to give up the fact that there are better ships out there that, that will do what you want to do better just because, whew, you know, you yeah. want to fly around in style. <laughs> and it's the, the hangar is beautiful too. I think this is the only ship maybe with a, a rear opening hangar and yeah. it looks so cool. I really, really like that. It almost feels like a station hangar, um, at least the older ones that are kind of side slung where you fly in. Uh, yeah. I, I love the look too. Um, yeah. I think it, I think it's a lot more practical too. Like, you know, you start questioning like your ability to land on a ship while it's in flight. Like think about a time you have to get out of somewhere in a hurry, right? Like when you're flying in and you're trying to do a top hanger and all of a sudden you're having to ma- match speed going forward right. and manage your downward strafe. Like you're, you're realistically, you're not really going to be able to pull that landing off. It's going to yeah. be too complicated. Um, so does auto landing eventually support kind of in flight within constraints abilities to land maybe. Uh, but when you all of a sudden are talking about just being able to fly in straight into a ship that's trying to make an escape, like, you think about like all the scenes of Battlestar Galactica where the ships come flying in hot into the hangars and kind of slide in as it's about to FTL. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of a possibility with a rear hangar like that. Obviously not to that degree, but it's it's appealing uh, aside from the fact that it's, you know, attractive. I wonder how that physics grid transition will work. Will you carry your, like if you're thrusting at 50% thrust and you go into the hangar, is that and and that ship is moving away from you is that speed going to be negated the speed difference so you'll just like fly yeah. forward into the wall really hard or will they just be like okay you're in this physics grid we'll we'll just carry over your momentum a little bit and like kind of sci-fi it so that you don't destroy uh, yourself it, it's it'd be interesting to see that but I'm yeah sure for sure that out. yeah but yeah I, I agree i mean the ships i think there's a lot to like about the ship um I, I mold over the galaxy pretty hard. Um, I didn't end up pulling the trigger just because I had ships that do basically all of those jobs aside from the expanse. Um, but I, it, to me, it wasn't the one that I, uh, jumped at just because again, I already had the ships, but if I was running a smaller fleet that didn't have the ones that supported those gameplays, the versatility combined with the look of the ship, it would have been a really hard path, like a really hard one to pass on for me. Well, when it comes to missions about where you would use a ship like this, and this is kind of where things get complicated because the game gameplay options, the three modules they have are a cargo module, a refining module, and a hangar? Or what was the third one? Uh, it is a medical. Medical. So this is like a industrial science sort of ship, right? If you were... 
supposedly tasked on a exploration mission. So you get something from the contract manager. It's a big exploration contract and you want to bring five of your friends with you and get on that ship. I'm wondering how, how realistic it is that you like, you would pick that ship. What is it that that mission would do or say that would make you and your friends feel the need to get on a galaxy, you know, as opposed to getting on a, something like a galaxy for sandbox gameplay for saying, oh yeah, we're just going to go out into the system and spend a couple of days out there and see what kind of trouble we can get into. You know what I mean? Like what, yeah. what besides sandbox gameplay, what's going to get people to bring these larger ships out? I don't know that I have a good answer. I think, you know, even the galaxy is interesting too, because if you compare it to a ship, like let's say the, I almost said the, uh, I don't know, let's just a general purpose ship, like a, let's say the, a Carrick, a Carrick. Okay, yeah. Um, a Carrick is a exploration ship that without having to change anything can do cargo, it can do bounties, it can do exploration it can do it supports the hangar like it's got a rover like there's a lot of things you can do in a carrick by default right yeah a, a galaxy though while we're admittedly talking about a much larger ship um a galaxy you have to pick the module that you're leaving with so that even that sandbox environment like i just want to go out into the universe and explore and live life and have crew on board you're already choosing to be dedicated to uh, refining or cargo or to um, medical, right? Yeah. So you're kind of already limiting what your flexibility is based on what you chose to leave the hangar with. So I think that kind of goes back to my question about uh, how much effort and time does it take to change these modules out? And is it something you can do at the drop of a hat or is it a real time investment? It, um, and you can maybe argue that the cargo one gives you the sandbox gameplay because you can throw vehicles and stuff in there. I don't, I don't know. But to me, again, it's master of done with the capability of doing a fair number of things. But I don't know how you plan on what you would leave with when using the ship. It seems like it is modular for the sake of being a specialized ship as opposed to modular for the sake of being for somebody who wants to use all those functions, you know, they're like, Hey, we've got a chassis, whatever you are. If you're like a medical or a finding person, get this module, put it in your ship, live with it kind of, kind of thing. But yeah, I think know. it's either that like the, I think this ship is sexy and I want to be able to do medical. So all of a sudden I've got a medical galaxy, or I think it's the tonight we're playing search and rescue. So I'm going to leave as a medic or in the medical version tomorrow. I know I'm wanting to make more money. So I'm going to take it back, dock it, claim it, get the cargo module ready. So it's tomorrow I'm going to run cargo. You know, I think it's more of a, your game session is where you kind of make your decision on how you're using it. I don't know that intra game session changes yeah, are, yeah. you know, really going to be supported in a way that lets you get a lot of value out of it. Yeah, it, it's probably just not even worth it. It's like having two different ships, and at some point you're just like, I don't feel like flying back to, to get that ship. Yeah, yeah. You end up, you you end up having like some hangar queens, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, you mentioned their refining, and I think that's a good a good one to jump into. We've had recently... So The Expanse was revealed, I think it was a year ago, and they revealed it kind of with i don't think they they expressly said that they were doing it for pyro but you kind of got the idea that it was something that they wanted to start to prepare for pyro refining stuff and and finishing out that game loop um recently they started to talk about ship refineries being worked on in the monthly report and and stuff like that might be coming soon what do you think of that gameplay overall and the main ship it's coming with the expanse yeah, so the the expanse is interesting in that it is. I think there was a lot of gray when it came to the expanse initially, right? Like it says it's got an onboard refinery. What is this really for? And I think people were like, "Well, can you take on jobs and can you do this and that? Like, what are you really going to be able to refine?" 
you know, and then it was more of a, okay, this is about fuel for my own consumption. Okay. So is this about hydrogen fuel and quantum fuel, or is this just about quantum fuel? And then it kind of really led down to the path where if I recall, right, it was just, this is really just for refining quantanium. And to be the, able to make the whole ship. Fuel. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I yeah, thought yeah. that was the Odyssey that did that. Oh, I'm sorry. Which one are we talking about? The uh, the Expanse. We skipped the Odyssey on this one. <laughs> yes, yes. Sorry, I made an audible there. <laughs> oh, all good, all good. Um, well, then, yeah. No, I agree. I think um, the Expanse is going to be uh, interesting with the refining. Um, I don't know that I necessarily feel like it was triggered for Pyro. Um, specifically, but I think it definitely supports operations in Pyro in a good way, just based on the scale of the you know the, the place. Yeah. I think the question that we still have to understand is how capable is the expanse compared to a refinery on a station? Um, you know, like you've got two different refineries on an expanse. You know, you can combine forces on them to make them work faster. Like, but does how does how how is it possible that an expanse can compete with a space station? Like it's not even a big ship; it's a small ship. <laughs> so how does it have the power needed, the size and a space available needed to be able to compete with a refinery? Um, you know, at a space station, and I just don't know that it will. But I think the hints were that it's going to be competitive. So uh, I think well, some of no oh, good. Well, the argument would have to be convenience, right? You can just refine stuff right there where you're mining it, and that that makes up for the fact that you can't load everything you you get in there. Convenience, cost, maybe. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think some of it could be. You know, we talk about those multiple gameplay loops, and we talked about the mining one before. But like, if if you're not having to have your cargo people run back to a refinery to drop off what's been mined, and instead you can just dump it off into a refinery that's on site with you in the expanse Ooh. and then all of a sudden you're actually taking refined ore to sell and you're not having to wait at a refinery for those goods i mean that that supports a more real-time payout for the operation um but again how fast does a refinery on a ship work i mean some of the jobs that we see at a station are uh, take a day you know the ones the ones that say this is going to take a long time it's going to be high yield and it's going to be cheap you know, kind of the trifecta yeah. is the, uh, it, you know, is it takes a day. Yeah. Yeah. You so know? that's, that's a good point. Maybe it's though only a certain, only certain ones of those, uh, those, those sequences, like the, the cheaper, faster ones that don't get you as high a payout. Maybe those are the only ones you could do on a ship or something. Yeah. I mean, maybe, um, or maybe it's, you know, expensive and fast, or maybe it doesn't matter how much it costs because whoever owns the expanse is probably the one that's going to dictate the price on what it takes. I don't know what it's going to cost to do it. So costs may be irrelevant because it's going to be determined by your expanse driver. Yeah. Um, and then that probably is going to depend on if this is somebody in your organization that just wants to, you know, cover the cost of operating versus somebody who's saying, I'm going to take a refining mission and bring this ship to you. I'm going to charge you a lot because now all of a sudden this is a premium service. Yeah. How do you think the the missions with refining would work? Do you think it's just going to be like what we're seeing with mining and salvage right now, just changed over to <laughs> minerals that you have to pick up? Yeah, I do. Um, but I think there's going to be some potentially additional complications on what needs to be addressed um, uh, because like a medical beacon, somebody just has to show up and really like revive you. Right. Like I think some of the beacons that are out there right now are just a little more simple, but I think the biggest thing that I question with the expanse is how does ownership of the ore work? Right. Um, uh, and refueling has an interesting mechanic built into where you pay for what you're going to need. And then if I leave early, I only pay for what I used, right? So I'm not necessarily like the money gets locked up in an escrow. What is what do we do with goods when you're holding on to somebody's stuff for an extended period of time? Like tomato, you you mine, you know, six bags of quantanium and then you give them to me. Quantanium is a good use case for the um, expanse too, because you don't have the travel time. Whether you have the unstable materials, by the way, mm -hmm. um, but you you give me your quantanium, which could potentially be a hundred thousand credits, and I start refining that. But it's on my ship now, 
So what prevents me from leaving with your stuff? Do you still own that? And now are we saying that commodities are something that the game is tracking with an ownership perspective? And with piracy, we might have to do that for some things. But I mean, mind or seems complicated. Yeah. So, yeah, I think there's just crime and legality and ownership questions on how that gets implemented that I'm questioning. Or maybe it's really simple. And they say, we don't have to solve for it. Reputation system will do this for you. You know, somebody shows up to a beacon and they've got a really terrible refining reputation. You probably aren't going to trust them. So I don't know. It'll be it might be a solving itself. Ownership is is every time I get into talks about industrial gameplay, whether it's mining, refueling, looting, uh, trading cargo. Ownership is a very, very difficult thing to figure out. I don't know if they have plans for that or what, but like there are a lot of times in this game in which you can get screwed over pretty intensely if if that system doesn't have your back. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that idea of reputation is going to mean a lot, you know, because and, and especially, you know, we, I think we started this by saying we run into the same people a lot. Like you, you kind of know who some of the bad actors are that kind of run in your circle, right? Like you see a name and you're like, oh, this guy, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. this person. But, you know, when we are now all of a sudden playing with people you know, in Australia that we don't normally see or Asia, like, you know, that's going to be like, okay, I don't know who this person is or what it really is. Like that, that reputation is going to mean so much about who, like who a person is and like yeah. what risk you're willing to take. Cause now all of a sudden you're in a risk assessment every time that you want to make a decision about how you interact with somebody. It better be the reputation system better get deep. Cause we're going to yeah. need to be able to know a lot of details. Um, one last question I had about The Expanse. This is something I, I'm still very unclear on. The Expanse is just a mineral refinery, right? This isn't for like gas and, and fuel. That's... Yeah, that, when, that's supposed to be on board the Starfair. Yeah, and when they talk about refining gameplay, they don't include that stuff about gas and fuel, right? That's kind of wrapped up in refueling because I keep, I keep, I hear refining and I'm like, okay, what kind of refining are they talking about? But generally, they are always talking about mineral refining whenever they... Yeah. Are bring this yeah. stuff up cool yeah so far it's all about mineral although i have to imagine the gameplay i don't think the refining gameplay is going to be any different right like i think it makes sense to have a similar screen and similar steps that you need to complete that would apply to gas um but i think the the, the real difference is going to be more in like the collection and like fuel scooping and like yeah, those yeah, types definitely. of things but um yeah you know as far as i'm aware of it's all been uh tied to just mineral I haven't heard much about gas at all other than we know the Starfair is supposed to have that ability. Yeah, yeah. Are there any other super... I wanted to hit all the highly anticipated ships today. Were there any that I might have missed? We didn't touch on the Odyssey. Um, but well, you didn't. I did, apparently. <laughs> you got there. <laughs> Jumped the gun a little bit. We, we, we might be able to have some time for the Odyssey, but were there any that I... May yeah, have... you know, there's one that I think is more exciting than I think is kind of underplayed by a lot of people a lot. Uh, and that one's the Anvil Liberator. Um, ah. Yeah, I think people sleep on it a little bit. But I think if we talk about ships that are going to change the way that we do things, especially with Pyro, um, that Liberator, I think, was specifically made as a gateway to allow people to play Pyro with the ships that we have in the game today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, even the slowest quantum drive, I mean, if if math is about right, like you're going to it's going to take a long time and you may not even have enough fuel to get anywhere in pyro with the way things are um, on a small ship. So, you know, now all of a sudden you're talking about you're either jumping between five different stations across pyro, which is not a, a, a fast way of doing it. And because, yeah, I mean, you know, you know, the mechanics of the game, every time you jump, you accelerate to your top speed and then you decelerate on the way down. So you're losing speed every time you do that, but you're also not going in the straight line. Yeah. So people may not mind going to a bunch of different stations because it feels realistic. But when you start doing the thing, at least that I do, because I have limited time where I play um, time to do a task matters to me. Uh, and having to stop at a bunch of different stations would is a big inconvenience to me. Um, so having a ship like the liberator where you're actually able to transport ships in that straight line 
You're not tied to large ships because you have a carrier that can get the job done at a fair price point. Um, I think it's a, a ship that we're going to see a ton of because the gameplay is probably going to necessitate it. And it opens the door to a lot of ships that we like using today in a system where we, they wouldn't be all that practical tomorrow. Yeah, I think the Liberator is an interesting beast. It's one that I actually expected them to be working on earlier, um, considering they, for all we know, haven't started work on it. What I'm most interested in, though, is how are people going to make money with it? Are they going to are there going to be jobs where you have to transport full ships or maybe ground vehicles or or something like that? I think so. Yeah, I do. I think there's going to be people that are making money just transporting ships from A to B. That'll be cool. Uh, yeah, and I think it's a good uh, organizational uh, ship. Like I'm supporting an org by being able to transport, you know, three three fighters on our behalf. Um, I also think that there's going to be almost like a transport beacon, but this is going to be like a ship hauling beacon where, okay, I just arrived at Pyro and now I need to get to the other side. I don't want to stop a bunch of times. I wouldn't be surprised if Liberators camp out by jump points um, and just wait for those, you know, basically play a taxi. Um, and then I think there's also potentially another dynamic that I think is almost like that fleet carrier idea from Elite Dangerous. Um, where you could potentially be transporting things for people even when they're not online, um, which I think could be pretty clutch too. And yeah. that's obviously way more complicated from a development perspective, so I don't think that's short-term. Um, but you know, if I take a mission that says, by Friday at noon, you want me to take your Gladius, your Glaive, and your hornet to you know from this station to this station and i all of a sudden have like temporary ownership rights or abilities to pull your ships and get them loaded like that's a really interesting dynamic that i think is probably actually important to, for them to put some thought into um just because they'll we, do it i i hope so and i think the reason i say that is is because um they don't have to support the person that doesn't play a ton but at the end of the day, most people, like you're going to have your core gamers that play multiple hours every single day and their ability to get a ship from six state or six systems away for an org operation on, you know, for a Friday night, they, they can do that. But the, the guy that's like, got like, you know, four kids and a demanding job and he's like, I play two days a week for two hours. Like he can't really realistically do those types of things and be able to keep up with like the other players. But if you give people the ability to kind of support things like that and say, you're paying me to transport your three ships and I have temporary ownership of them and I can haul them and dock them at your location, you'll pay me because the time is money um, and you get to experience the game that you want to. That Something like that, I think, becomes more relevant and important the more systems we get. And if we get to a point to where it takes a significant amount to tra tra traverse a system and be you have to do that potentially like seven times, like if you bought the star map, it's all over the place, right? Yeah. So I think those types of things are probably not front of mind for anybody, but I think are things that are quality of life improvements and potentially make, you know, meaningful changes for people in the way that they want to play the game are things that they'll eventually probably need to start thinking about how they can implement. Yeah. And I think, like you said, taking those people who play this all the time, hours every day, and using them to benefit the people who are not able to do that, like you said, use, taking the people who are playing every day, hiring them to move the ships of those who can't when they're offline is like a good way of utilizing your player base to help you keep your player base healthy. I like that yeah. idea. While giving other people an activity, right? Like, yeah. I'm, I'm 38. I'm, I'm that guy that has multiple kids and you know, job and family time and other stuff. Like, I don't play as much as a lot of the younger guys in my org. Like, if I could just even give them money to be able to do it for me, like, I, yeah. it'd be huge. That's nice. That'd be nice. Um, of all the ships that we talked about today, what do you think is the most important to progress the game overall? That's a really good question. Uh, I think probably the conversation around the whole sea is probably the most important. Not that cargo itself is the most relevant topic, 
we've had arguably had cargo longer than anything other than maybe combat. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's more of the downstream implications of what it really means. Um, how can the game manage such large quantities of items? Are there game plays and uh, the way that systems interact with each other to be able to um, validate a ship of that size in the game? That ship coming into the game with all it needs to track um, and potentially the mission types that might come along with it, I think are good indications of significant progress from a tech perspective on the game that might mean that um, we're getting closer to the real thing. Uh, you know, I think the other ships that we talked about, like the market on the BMM, cool, not necessary. Um, you know, we have a couple combat ships in there. Cool. We have those already, right? Like they're interesting and fun and they all have their little niche, little niche. Um, you're getting, you're getting a bunch of hate comments from Polaris hunters down below right now. <laughs> just disregarding <laughs> their golden boy. <laughs> uh, well, what are you going to do? I like but it too. I already said I like it. You um, are you're you're spot on though. Like with the hull C, the the physics grids, the sp space station docking, the cargo refactors, the tractor beams, the economy, the commodities, like all this stuff has to be working for the hull C to make sense. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's there's a lot of foundational things that go into that ship being successful. Um and I think they impact a lot of different aspects of our game. So um, I think not necessarily just a cargo ship, but what that specific ship really means to the game is significant in my mind. And so you're you're putting your money behind the idea that they are not just dropping the game in, or not just dropping the ship in, they are preparing the game for the ship. I would say that's my vote and my <laughs> assumption, um, but more than anything, I would say that's my hope. I hope, yeah. That's it's always it's always a <laughs> top of hope for us. We're like, you know, this sounds like a good idea. It sounds like something they would be doing, but we we just hope. <laughs> we just hope. <laughs> I do, I yeah. do really hope. I think the um, the whole C coming into the game. If we get the freight elevators with that, and if they like updated the commodity with the mining changes we're doing in three nineteen, like it could be an actually interesting place to live and do missions by, by this time next year. And I feel like I said that last year, um, but last year we weren't getting the cargo refactor. So at least, at least things are happening now. Yeah. Yep. Things, things are coming along. Yeah. It's a, a little bumpy ride with 318, but I think it's uh, again, foundational stuff. We, we knew ahead of time, CIG did a nice job of at least expressing that, you know, this was going to be a, uh, a long road to release. Um, beyond that, it was potentially some new tech that was going to maybe be, not be that exciting on the surface level, but was back end stuff that was important. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you're in, you know, Ivakati or not, but, you know, I think we, there's a certain level of communication there that's just like, hey, you, you kind of understand like things, things are significant that are happening and they're difficult. Um, and, I mean, frankly, I thought it should have hung around in Evocati and PTU for a little bit longer than it did. But uh, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. Like the changes that they're making are important and they're getting done. Um, and I know they frustrate the hell out of people, but it's moving in the right direction. It is. Yeah, it's it's tripping and stumbling, but it's getting there. Is there anything else that, uh, going throughout this year? Maybe, you know, we don't have anything confirmed, but something that you're looking out for that you're hoping that we do that we do see before the year's end? I think for me, man, the the only thing that I'm really like, I, I just want pyro. I, I really want pyro. And I think it's mostly not, not even because I want to go see pyro or it's somewhere new that we haven't been flying around because frankly, there's, I, we've been flying around in Stanton for, I mean, how long now? It's been a while. <laughs> yeah. And I, I still find things that I look at and I'm like, ah, this game is awesome or this game is beautiful. Or I, I don't even think I've been here before. <laughs> like, like the stuff still shows up in the system that we're in. Like the scale of the game is wild. So it's not even about new or fresh. Um, I think for me, Pyro just represents kind of like the whole season. Like we've talked systems for so long, like jump gates are going to be, you know, tech that needs to get figured out. Um, I think it changes the way that players are naturally going to congregate. Um, hopefully that is increasing server sizes as well because people are more spread out. So the servers can kind of balance some of that loading. Like pyro for me is the one that I just think is 
probably going to get a lot of people reinvigorated with the game. And you can you, you can always feel the ebb and flow of uh, yeah. you know yeah. the players, right? And it's most of the time it's in that um, that release cycle where it's like, oh, there's so much hope. It released, it's buggy, and then some patches come in and it's better. And then all of a sudden everybody just waits for the next patch and people get yeah. a little disenfranchised. Um, I think it's because they, they don't feel that meaningful change from patch to patch, which is fine. Uh, but I think once once we start having additional systems come in and the ability to start tying those together and the impacts that those systems are having on each other, um, I think for me that's probably the biggest thing. Um, I think with that is you know just the server meshing and how that tech comes along. Um, you know, it's again how do we, how do we take those steps that get us closer to kind of that unified universe versus um, you know really living kind of in the segregated shards that we're in right now yeah it does feel like right now we're getting more substantial steps towards that than than we were before and that's been nice yeah all right young blood thank you so much for joining me for the show today this is a good talk got to talk a lot about ships which like i said happy topic people love ships it's uh <laughs> you know it's sitting back no drama it's nice i'm always happy to talk ships favorite yeah. topic um it's been good coming on and talking to you like uh yeah I, I admire the work that you do and your channel and stream and everything it's uh you're enjoyable to talk to and listen to so you're doing you're doing good work well likewise as i made very clear i i am a fan and i'd like to give you the chance to let everybody else know if they haven't already where they can find your own content your videos and stuff. yeah so um i'm on youtube if you search stl youngblood just like under my picture over here um that's where you'll find me uh, typically if you search for something about a ship, it'll pop up. Um, I technically have a Twitch, um, also STL Youngblood. Uh, I don't think that thing's been live in like five years. <laughs> <laughs> um, but who knows? I mean, with me having more challenging times trying to, uh, get video production done, um, doing some live streams might be a good way to kind of get back out there a little bit. So we'll see. Uh, and then on Twitter, STL Youngblood, again, don't use that real often. So really, if you're looking for me, it's YouTube is the place. You should get on Twitter more, man. The Star Citizen community is popping off over there. Yeah. Yeah. It's always, it's always fun. I uh, Probably quarterly, I jump back onto it and I start kind of <laughs> just uh, perusing around and I'm like, oh, these people are going at it. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's some topics out here. Yeah. We like our Twitter battles. I'll keep an eye out for you next time, man. Um, thank you again so much for coming on episode 101. If you're watching on YouTube, thanks for watching. If you're listening on the ad-free audio platforms, thanks for that. And if you're watching live as a supporter, thank you. We appreciate you. And uh, one last time before we go, STL, thank you so much again for joining me. Thanks for having me on. It's been fun. See you all next week. Mm -hmm.